be presenting a timely panel entitled hashtag Black Taxpayers Matter, COVID-19 and Communities of Color, CARES Act Failures and Constitutional Litigation. This panel, as you know, is sponsored by the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. It has also uh, been sponsored by the Economic Justice Committee. This panel is one of a series of rapid response webinars to COVID-19. We're actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please do visit the website. In addition, I have been kind of committed given the COVID-19 crisis, as well as the dis disproportionate impact on communities of color, especially truly black individuals. So what we're doing or what I'm hoping to do as an advocate, rather than being just an ally, I want to be anti-racist. And the way I'm going to do that is by putting together panels that affirmatively reach out and say Black taxpayers matter. So if you in the audience have any ideas for different panels, please feel free to email me. I'm a law professor at UNLV. My name is Francine Lippman. I'm going to moderate this panel. And my email address is Francine dot lipman at unlv.edu. So please do reach out to me. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions. What you're the way you're going to be doing that though is you're not we're not going to be able to hear you. You're going to use the QA. Do not use the chat function. We're not going to be looking at the chat function. We're going to be looking at the QA function. If you don't see those controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We're going to try to address the questions either during the panel as somebody sees the question and thinks, well, I'll, I'll respond to that now live or at the end of the panel. Hopefully we'll have time. We are going to be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered. And that will include copies of the PowerPoints as well. So you can share this panel as it's recorded widely on your net, in your networks. And what's nice is it will be posted on the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice website. So you can refer back to it in a week or so and refer your colleagues to it as well. We have an incredible panel today. And what I've tried to do is bring together different scholars from different disciplines because the intersection of tax, civil rights, economic justice, sociology, and psychology really is so intersectional. And I think too often we silo ourselves as lawyers and as other scholars. So I've been working hard to work with other individuals. And I'm so proud to have found two exceptional sociologists. And I, I just want to out myself a little bit. I would really love to go back and get a PhD in sociology. So I'm a little jealous of you two. We have Stephen Brown, who is going to be speaking first. He is a research associate in the Center on Labor Human Services and Population, and the Research to Action Lab at the Urban Institute. I encourage you to go to the Urban Institute's website. It's phenomenal and really is a, a wonderful repository of excellent information. His work covers projects concerned with racial disparities in economic opportunity. And I found Stephen by reading a, just an exceptional piece that I hope will be pushed out to you, talking about the economic impact on communities of color, African-American individuals, as well as Latinx individuals. Stephen Brown is an exceptional writer and scholar, and he's come from a couple schools that some of you have probably heard of, 
Princeton and Harvard. He's a sociologist and he's currently earning his PhD in sociology. After Stephen, we have the incredible Donnie Charleston. He's a director of state and local fiscal policy engagement at the Urban Institute as well. His work focuses on translating research for decision makers and translating the needs and priorities of state policymakers for urban researchers. What's interesting about that is he's trying to take our ideas as scholars and actually implement them. So talk about being an advocate, take these great brilliant epiphanies and put them on the streets, especially in state and local government. Uh, Donnie also holds a degree in sociology and psychology. And again, he uh, will be joining, he will be speaking after Stephen. And then we're going to translate, we're going to transition a bit when we hear about the economic impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, what COVID-19 has unfortunately done is demonstrated the fractures that already existed in communities. And we're seeing that playing out in police violence, as well as uh, incredible unemployment, uh, food insecurity and housing insecurity. And so it has become unfortunately a perfect storm. What's interesting about this is there's a whole, a, a lot of ideas for remedies here. But one of the remedies we're going to talk about specifically today is from one of my law school classmates is co-counsel on some federal litigation. And that is Professor Les Book. He's a law professor at Villanova University. And many of us know him because he's a regular blogger and founder of Procedurally Taxing. If you are a tax person at all, you have to follow that blog. It's phenomenal and daily and very detailed, very up to date. He's also an author of the top tax procedure legal case book. And so he is the go-to man uh, when we talk about tax procedure. And he is incredibly exciting excited about being co-counsel with Robert Friedman. Robert Friedman is going to be our last speaker and then Les will follow up, give us some closing remarks. Robert Friedman is senior counsel at the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. Robert is at Georgetown and they are doing incredible litigation. And I'm incredibly excited that that's now including tax litigation. So we're seeing some frontline constitutional litigation for individuals who are suffering by not getting the economic impact payment from the CARES Act. And as you're gonna hear about this, these are individuals, US citizen children, where at least one parent in the household does not have a social security number that's valid for work. Those families who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 because many of them are essential workers having to work or, and they're already financially precarious, they're not getting the resources. And so the good news is, the wonderful news is there are helpers out there. And Robert is one of those helpers who's litigating this in federal court. Robert has clerked for the Second Circuit and also the Southern District of New York, which is getting a lot of attention right now. So as you can see, we have an incredible panel. And all I get to do is introduce them and sit back and listen. And so please join me in listening to these advocates, these brilliant minds, talk about how we can push, push the ball up this steep hill. And we're gonna start off with Stephen Brown from Urban Institute. Thank you, Stephen, and all of you. I, I appreciate you being here today. 
Thanks so much. Thank you, Francine, for that incredible introduction. Um, and so I'm going to uh, share my screen and go ahead and get this presentation started. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to, so my presentation is um, more about um, setting the stage. So as uh, Francie pointed out, my, I'm not uh, a lawyer. Um, and so I claim to have no legal expertise. I'm not going to uh, attempt to bring any in during this conversation. So I, I'm coming to this conversation uh, as a sociologist, as an empirical researcher, as someone who studies um, um, the sources of and solutions to racial inequality on a daily basis. And I'm happy to be joined here today by my colleague, uh, Donnie Charleston. Um, we've been working together closely on um, several different projects over the past couple of years. And so I'm, I, hopefully we're going to have um, some really important and meaty content for you today. Um, so my presentation is titled The Crisis for All of Us versus The Crisis for Some of Us. Okay. So a little bit, I'm going to. A little bit more about the Urban Institute. The Urban Institute, uh, and for people who are not familiar, um, is the trusted source of unbiased, authoritative uh, insights that inform consequential choices about the well being of people and places in the United States. We are a nonprofit research organization um, that believes decisions are faced, based by, shaped by facts rather than ideology and have the power to improve public policy and practice, strengthen communities, and transform people's lives for the better. And so we are very much about evidence and bringing evidence to bear in situations. And so um, that's what we hope to do today. So this thing is going to come for us all. So sorry, let's see if I set my time on. So this thing is going to come for us all. Um, this is a quote from an article in the New York Times uh, a couple months ago, right? You know, we were in the thick of it. Things were starting to shut down. There's a lot of uncertainty around what was going to happen. Um, and this quote sticks with me and resonates with me because, you know, it was said in the context of that this wasn't going to just be um, low-income workers who are at the front lines who are going to be affected by this, but this is going to be white collar. This is going to be all kinds of workers who are going to be um, detrimentally, detrimentally affected by the COVID crisis. But um, I think the, the reason this quote sticks with me and resonates with me so much is because it is true. Right? The COVID crisis is um, a nearly unprecedented combination of crises um, that our country has faced. Um, and as a result, um, we are it's a nearly unprecedented crisis, but I think when we think about what's going on, um, it's not exactly coming for us all. It is coming for us all, but it's coming for some of us more than it's coming for the rest of us. And so I think um, that's something I want to think uh, folks to kind of reflect on um, and probably have been reflecting on already is how this situation is um, the detrimental and we're all fully related to the effects of COVID-19. Um, many of us have probably even had people who have, uh, know people um, who have passed away from COVID related complications, but the economic impacts of this, this crisis are um, proven to be especially severe for communities of color. So the first thing I want to start off is by talking about the big, um, the big factor here. So Black Americans are overrepresented among um, people who have um, passed away from COVID-19 complications. So what you're looking at are the death rates for white, Latino, and uh, Black adults um, per 100,000 um, by age groups. Um, and so there's been a lot of talk, of course, about how um, people who uh, pass away from COVID are older, and that's certainly the case here. Right? You see these big bars at the top. Um, but at every age group, uh, I think there are two things to take away here. One is that at every age group, um, you see that both Latino and, and Black adults are more likely, much more likely in some cases, um, to pass away from COVID-related complications. Um, and the second thing is that um, for white adults, the blue bars, um, you, it is primarily about, uh, it is primarily um, um, hitting and hurting um, older white adults, but for black and brown uh, adults, it hit, you're seeing much more uh, prominent death rates getting younger down into their 60s and their 50s and their 40s um, in a way that you don't see for these other groups. And so um, this is certainly, I mean, it certainly impacted older adults uh, more profoundly, but at every age group and even at younger ages, um, 
the people who are passing away disproportionately from COVID-19 are people of color. And so the next, uh, so getting to the economic crisis, right? So when we look at the unemployment rate, um, the black unemployment rate, the yellow line, has consistently been the highest unemployment rate for um, pretty much as far as back as we have data on it. Um, and so this is from uh, the beginning of the Great Recession until just now, um, the most recent data that we have. And throughout this period, with the exception of one point uh, or two points, the most recent um, two months, black unemployment has been the highest, uh, followed by Latino unemployment, which recently topped um, black unemployment for the first time that black line in um, April 20, in April a couple of months ago. But what we're seeing here is that the disparities that we see in the labor market are not new. The things that we're seeing in the past couple of months are not new. These are trends that have been prominent and embedded in the labor market for, for decades. Um, and I think we are just now seeing how the disparities that have been embedded in the labor market are manifesting even more profoundly um, as people lose their jobs and lose their incomes. Um, and so this is um, just kind of a, a reflection of this is in some ways not new, not surprising. It's just more severe um, than it has been in the past. And so part of what frames this whole conversation, Ethan, I think, is yes. Ethan, I'm just going to, uh, some folks are asking you to talk a little louder. So maybe get oh, closer okay. to that. Yep. Thank you. OK. want to hear I'm every word. <laughs> Um, I'm actually using headphones, so I will I will speak up. Um, so the next thing um, I want to frame up is the racial wealth gap. And so when I think about um, racial and economic inequality, the racial wealth gap is the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, you know, the most recent data that we have from 2016 show that um, on average, or the, on the median, um, white families hold 10 times the wealth of, of black families and eight times the wealth of Latino families. And when you think about what that means, you know, the actual numbers are median 170,000 um, versus 17,000 or versus 20, 21,000. These are real substantial differences in terms of an abil a family's ability to, to cover their losses or to pay for their mortgage or pay for their rent in the instance of a major job loss or to pay for education, to pay for health care if you get really sick. Um, and so this gap, I think, more than anything else, um, reflect, reflects how this economy um, produces unequal gains um, for people of color. And I think it only, it also shows that when things like this happen, people of color are in a much less strong position to kind of ride it out, to kind of support themselves through um, these economic crises. And so this is, I think, kind of really reflects that when people lose their jobs, they have much, they have much fewer resources to draw upon to support themselves during these moments. And so I think that's something we also want to keep in mind that um, folks are, are, are in really tough spots um, in, in this moment. So that's um, what I think the racial wealth gap is showing us. And so at the beginning, Francine referenced this blog that um, I wrote a few weeks ago that looked at some sample uh, some data that um, some team, another team at the Urban Institute has been pulling together. Um, and one of the things that came out of that, and though this is data from uh, the earlier part of the, um, the COVID crisis, so March and April. Um, and so this finds that during that period of time, um, Latinos and Blacks were much more harder hit in terms of losing jobs, um, losing um, work hours, and losing income. And so this is not just the employment rate. This is including furloughs. This is including um, people whose hours are cut. And we see that Latinos in particular were especially hard hit during this moment and during this crisis of losing jobs, losing their hours, having work cut. Um, and I think um, we're, I'm going to so get a little bit more into that in the next couple of slides, but I think this is something um, that shows that this crisis is not hitting, um, again, this crisis is not hitting folks equally. And something, that, another piece to keep in mind here is that um, the kinds of jobs that people work in, whether they're considered essential or non-essential, um, black people in particular are still in jobs that are considered essential, even though things are starting to open up not more, but you know, they're the folks who are working in grocery stores, working in delivery, working, you know, bring, bring our packages, um, 
that's working in trash and public transit. So they're also, even though their job losses weren't as severe at the early start, um, they were certainly at risk and still continue to be at risk of increased exposure, as we saw from the, the first slide on the death rate. So this is uh, um, Black people, I think, um, again, even though if they're not losing their jobs, they are certainly at more risk of exposure. Uh, and so the economic and the health impacts, again, continue to be uneven by race and ethnicity. And so the national unemployment rates, uh, even though the national unemployment rates are improving, right? So there was a big to do a few weeks ago about how the unemployment rate actually unexpectedly dropped a few points or dropped one point. Um, but even with the increasing unemployment rate, people's confidence in the future is still not quite as strong. And so what I'm showing you is some data that we have pulled together from this um, um, tool that we're about to release next week called the Real COVID-19 Racial Equity Tracker. Um, and so this is from the Census Pulse, which is a weekly survey that the census is doing to kind of track how people are dealing with the COVID crisis. And what we're finding here, and so is, and so what this graph is telling us is this is the expectations of having, of expectations of someone in your household losing money um, from a job sometime in the next few weeks. And what we see here is that for uh, people of color, um, Black and Latinos, they're seeing elevated rates. Um, over half in, um, for Latinos of expecting that they're not going to have, they're going to have less income in the few weeks. And so what this means is that folks, even though the economy is improving, even though things are getting better, folks are still worried that I may not have a job in a few weeks. I may not still have enough income in a few weeks. I'm still at risk here. And so I think even with supposedly, you know, economic recovery, which I think it's way too early to say that we're in one, um, people are still concerned, even on average, that um, they're still going to be on some hard times in the next few weeks. And so um, I think, and what that tells me is that even though people may still be working, um, their jobs are still not very stable. And so there's still a risk that something might happen that might uh, destabilize them that might cause them to lose their job, might cause them to lose their income, that might put them in a hard place. And without, again, that wealth to fall back on, um, they're certainly in a, a financially unsure position, especially going forward in the next few weeks as um, the unemployment um, additional benefits run out. And so it'll be interesting to see how people think about um, where their income is in a few weeks when we're coming towards the cliff uh, of those unemployment benefits running out. And also during this period, so this one is about saving. So we've been talking about saving, we're talking about the racial wealth gap. Um, and what we also found is that um, Latino families in particular, but also Black families as well, um, the majority of whom drew down most of their savings during this early part, right? They lost their jobs. Um, and so rent still due, utilities were off, off uh, utilities still due, car bills still due. And so the little savings that they did have most of them uh, had to draw down most most people had to most black and brown people had to draw down most of their savings um and so imagine being in a situation where you now lost your job you've paid down most you draw down most of your savings in order to get through to the next thing and now you're in a situation where um you still don't have work now you're without savings and what happens if something goes wrong what happens if you don't get a job in the next couple of weeks or in the next couple of months um, and you have no more savings to draw upon and the unemployment benefits run out. I mean, I think, you know, that really kind of speaks to the potential um, precipice that we're, we're reaching where folks might really fall from being on a very fragile ground to being in a, a full, full out economic um, disaster. And so I think this is something um, to be really concerned about how most families, you know, they're exhausted at what they have little to draw upon right now. So. Um, this is also a really concerning thing that we're seeing at the moment. Um, and I think one of the things that has become increasingly clear is that um, the job impacts of the COVID-19 crisis has actually hit um, more severely among Latino households. Um, and so let's, in particular, Latino households with non-citizens. And so we see here that nearly 70% of Latino households with non-citizens um, in them lost a job, lost earnings, or got their hours cut, nearly 70%, um, which is an incredible loss. Um, 
And again, they also drew down their savings. They have fewer savings to draw upon. And not only that, um, as the next slide shows, they also have access to fewer benefits, right? And so a lot of the benefits um, that have been rolled out, um, employment insurance, uh, um, health care in some states, a lot of um, immigrants so are not eligible for and uh, people who are here illegally are ineligible for all of the benefits. And so they are in a situation where um, if the head of the household is here legally, they don't have access to any of these benefits. And so when they lose their job um, and when they've drawn down their savings, there is no additional recourse for them at this point. Um, and so these data are from 2018 and 2019, but they're showing us um, that folks because of this whole public charge thing, they're scared away. And so even when they qualify for benefits, they don't access them. Um, and so you have people who qualify for benefits, don't access them, and then people who are, and then you have large uh, sections of those um, immigrant families who are un, who are not qualified for benefits. And I think this um, certainly raises the alarm about what this means for work, many working families who have been affected by this crisis. Um, and so the last thing I wanna cover is, um, what has happened to the business owners. And so um, we see that um, this crisis uh, has hit business owners particularly hard. And so there's been a lot of talk about the PPP dollars and where they did and did not go. And though we don't know exactly um, which businesses uh, owned by people of color got PPP dollars, we do know, we feel pretty confident that it was not most of them. Um, and even when they did get PPP dollars, they were largely distributed uh, towards the business, the kind of businesses that black people do not own, right? So what we see here is that um, black business owners only own 2.2% um, of all businesses in the United States. Um, Latinos only own 5.6% of businesses in the entire United States. And those are concentrated in these industries that are very much in person, right? Think about your restaurants, think about your catering business, think about bar barbershops and beauty salons, things that are a lot harder to replace than to do remotely. Um, and without the aid of some kind of business um, support during this time, a lot of them have been uh, suffering disproportionately. Let's skip a couple of slides ahead. And so, um, again, we don't know where the PPB dollars, how they were distributed to people, the business owners of color, but we know that they, we feel pretty confident that they didn't get most of them. And re the most recent research has found that um, upwards of 41% of Black-owned businesses have closed potentially permanently in the past few months. Um, and when you think about that, right, think about all the hard work and sweat equity and actual equity that went into starting those businesses um, just to have in a couple of months, 40% of them just disappear. Um, and it's a tremendous economic loss. And you still see um, nearly a third of Latino businesses have also closed during this time period. And so I think um, this is all to set up a pretty um, depressing story. Uh, I don't think it was, my, my ask today to give you a sense of hope, um, but to give you a sense of the re economic realities of what we're dealing with. And I think it is a very, very dire and um, unprecedented when you combine the wealth gap and the job losses and the loss in wealth and the loss of business. All this is wrapped up to um, being a situation that without some kind of corrective action, um, it is going to lead to a something greater than a depression for people of color. Um, in the very near term. Um, so that is it. And with that, I will um, uh, hand it over to my colleague, uh, Donnie Charleston. Uh, thank you, Stephen, um, for that great presentation. And thank you, Francine, for the introduction at the beginning. I'm uh, very honored to be here with you today. And uh, Stephen provided a great overview of the Urban Institute and what we do, what we try to accomplish here with our research. Um, my role here today is to provide you with some a uh, bit of context for the, for this topic and to follow up my colleague's presentation with uh, and underscore some of the information he provided with some historical and particularized um, data and information about our tax system that exacerbates many of the challenges that he um, noted in his presentation. To start off, uh, I wish I had all of you in the room together. I would kind of show, ask you to show uh, show show um, response to this question by raising your hands, but I'll ask it anyway. And you can kind of answer it to yourselves in your heads. You know, how many of you know someone who lives in subsidized housing? I suspect that very few, few of you out there who are watching this um, raise, have raised your hands. Uh, now, the next question I have for you is how many of you actually live in subsidized house, housing yourself? Probably yet fewer still individuals out there have raised their hands in response to that question. Now, my last question to you is this. How many of you took advantage of the mortgage interest deduction on your 2019 taxes? 
probably all of you, or the majority of you raised your hands. And my response to you is, congratulations, you live in subsidized housing. Now, we tend not to think about those types of issues and, and not to think about the mortgage interest reduction as a subsidy, but in essence, that's essentially what it is. It's a subsidy paid to individuals through the tax code. But we tend to associate uh, things like subsidies with others. And we devalue, we value things we associate with ourselves and devalue things we associate with others. And I want to kind of uh, keep that, just keep that in the back of your mind as I wrote the presentation and kind of walk you through some of the aspects of our tax code and how it's evolved and changed over time. I'm going to share my screen with you and pull up a presentation. All right, here we go. All right, so here's the reality. So why the focus, first, why the focus on state and local taxes? For one, the COVID crisis is playing out at the state and local level. Governors and mayors and county officials are leading the charge in addressing the fallout and will be the lead entities to address the recovery. I mean, Stephen was saying, once we actually get to a recovery. Now, this slide, um, it's important to, to, to know that um, this whole idea of black taxpayers is a contested idea um, when we think about it. Um, it's not something that is um, commonly accepted from the standpoint of the idea that black taxpayers matter. I mean, as is the case with researchers, we have a fascination with defining terms. You know, what do we mean by taxpayer? And it's not necessarily just an academic exercise. It's something we have to dive into and really kind of wrestle with um, because it's been a contested term and a contested idea over time. And it's been inextricably linked to this idea of race in America. And we'll get to that, to more of that here in a second. And so as we focus on the state and local context, it's important to know that um, in addition to how this is playing out at the local level, um, we tend to kind of have in our minds taxes, we think more about federal taxes than we do about state and local taxes. But the reality is, is that um, for every dollar in taxes that we pay, I mean, virtually a third of it is in state and local taxation. We look at the total combined uh, federal receipts and taxes, 64% of the total was federal receipts, um, 21% of it being state and 15% 15, 15 of it being uh, local taxes. Now, when we look at sources of state and local general revenue, this kind of shows you the breakdown of all the different sources of revenue that states have available to them. And we can see that it's primarily property taxes, but they heavily rely on sales taxes and the individual income tax and transfer, just being money they receive from the federal government, kind of rounding out the top of the list. And we talk about these racialized origins of the modern tax system. As I was saying at the top of my presentation, um, it's very much been a contested concept, this idea of black taxpayers. And we look at all the different, uh, different types of taxes that I just showed you kind of snapshots of in that stacked uh, bar chart. Uh, the reality is, is that um, for though each one of those taxes, especially the ones that state and local governments are most dependent upon, they have a racialized origin. When we look at the modern sales, sales tax in particular, um, that goes back and dates back rather to the um, to, 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 Mississippi, to, to many years ago uh, when in Mississippi. Um, before we get to that, um, we talk a little bit about uh, um, reconstruction era. So when we go back to the reconstruction era and we think about taxation and how it's evolved over time, um, we, there's a history in this country of white officials, particularly in the South, you know, arguing that federal laws were committing a crime against white taxpayers by forcing them to assist, you know, quote, you know, quote unquote, the idle Negro, um, individuals who were, you know, as, as they had trans transitioned from being enslaved to being free members of society and unable to access opportunities and jobs, there was a backlash and a frustration on behalf of white taxpayers. And they were, you know, in claiming their identity and status as true taxpayers as compared to uh, the black citizens there in their communities. Essentially what we had, what, what had was, and still have to some extent, is a weaponizing of the term taxpayer as a way of othering black citizens and carving out a special status for, for themselves and creating, if, uh, if you will, a social hierarchy and demarcating us versus them. Um, and But reality is for anyone who's, you know, taking a civics class and all of you lawyers up there very much know this, um, this you know, base issue dates back even farther than that and goes back to the three-fifths compromise is they counted every person held in bondage as three-fifths of the person, not just for congressional representation, which is what we tend to focus on, but it was also for direct tax, for taxation purposes. Um, before the compromise, um, taxes were levied on land ownership, but there was this whole issue that arose with landowners consistently avoiding taxes by undervaluing their land. 
And so the, the union, the, the states at the time were trying to figure out how can we you know, create a better system? And so they decided to levy a tax based on population. And then, so they ended up coming with this three-fifths compromise that many of you know well, but it's important to the reason I note that is because going all the way back to that point to the inception of our country, we see black people being used as tools of power generation vis-a-vis -vis taxation early in the founding of our country. Now we move on um, talking about the sales tax. Um, in Mississippi, was Mississippi was the first state that's credited with having um, a modern form of retail sales tax. Um, the tax was implemented in 1932 in part to contend with the ravages of the Great Depression. Uh, now one could argue that it was inevitable the states would move to the use of a sales tax, but it's instructive to note that prior to the implementation of the sales tax in Mississippi, that, and for most states for that matter, uh, the property tax was a primary source of tax revenues. And the governor in Mississippi at the time, Governor Martin uh, Connor, won passage of the tax by arguing that while Blacks comprised 50% of Mississippi's population, uh, they utilized public goods, but they were paying less in taxes. So his goal and his, his, uh, his, his strategy was to appeal to the racial animus of the voting public uh, towards funding services for Black citizens. Following Mississippi, we see a rapid adoption of the sales tax by states all across the nation. And moving on to the property tax, which like I said, the time of the, the adoption of the sales tax in the 1930s and through the 1940s, with some states not adopting it later on to the 1960s even, um, we, the, the property tax was the primary revenue stream for state and local governments. Now, many of you are probably aware, more aware of the racialized aspects of the property tax, in particular, how we saw, for example, an increase in special tax districts being created and school zones being created uh, post reconstruction era after the civil war as white citizens sought to safeguard their tax dollars and of course, we're seeing it, we saw a deepening of that dynamic in the wake of the Brown versus Board of Education decision with the creation of city and county districts and special tax districts and small town school systems and a push for the use of public dollars to, to fund private secondary schools, school expenses, um, which was litigated in the courts and, 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 was, and, came, and which, was, uh, uh, which led to the Brown decision uh, was a consolidation of several number of cases in that instance. And when you look at, in particular, um, letters that were sent to the Supreme Court during that time, during the hearing of the Brown case, um, you find that white taxpayer identity was used as a justification for supporting segregation by Southern citizens and Northern advocates who were advocating and ple pleading to the justices um, to maintain segregated school systems. Lastly, we we'll talk about um, the, 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 this last final tax, which are fines and fees. Now, when we talk about fines and fees, um, we all are aware of how this issue gained prominence during the Ferguson crisis in the wake of the shooting death of Michael Brown some years ago and the resulting social unrest that occurred. Um, and in particular, if you look at fiscal year 2015, Ferguson budgeted 23% of its revenue from fines and fees. That's really unheard of. Um, and as many as you know, the Department of Justice, you know, ended up filing a complaint and ended up entering into, entering into a consent decree uh, with, and I'll go back for a second slide here, this slide, um, this kind of shows you how anomalous Ferguson's tax system was compared to other states, not only just in Missouri, but across the country as well. And so they ended up entering into a consent decree with the federal government. Um, to address many of the issues that were in place with respect to the structure of this tax system in the community. Um, this map here shows you um, uh, how the distribution of communities are that have a problematic dependence on fines and fees across the country. And if you know, I mean, it's very clear and obvious that many of those states are in the southern part of the country um, and in the northeastern corridor, the upper Midwest, with a few dots out in the rest of the country. Now, is you cannot divorce that reality, the reality of that map from the history and the historical legacy of the criminal justice system, in particular, how it played out in the South um, it, with the convict lease system and the, uh, the, the, the practices of law enforcement in those communities and the heavy handed police tactics as a means of populating jails and prisons to serve as a labor force for landowners in the South who had lost their um, their, 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 their free labor uh, through enslaved people. And so that's a practice that kind of carried itself out through the decades and created the modern prison system that we have today. 
Um, and if any of you are interested in you know, digging down deep into that, a book, um, Slavery by Another Name, is a great book that kind of lays out that entire history in great detail if you're interested in reading more about that. Um, so this is last, last slide about uh, fines and fees shows you, this is from our partners at the uh, Brookings Institution, the Hamilton Project there, shows you the reality of how criminal justice debt collection plays out by race. And so you see communities that have higher black populations, have a higher reliance on their revenue from fines and fees. Now, this brings us to a question, which is indeed a vexing question. Um, I, would, I would argue that our system would indeed look different, you know, if our system had developed outside of a racialized caste system, which is what we have and had in that, in that, during, that during the time of the, or the evolution and development of a modern tax system. Now, we can look at the trajectories of tax adoption and the use of taxes in different regions. We can compare states with different levels of diversity. And we see clear differences related to how these systems change pre and post influxes of people and of people of color and immigrants. It kind of reinforces this idea that taxes develop and evolve um, as in part a function of how diverse a community is and this notion and of, of, of public goods, who pays for public goods, who's deserving, who's not deserving. Now, this next question um, is, is definitely warranted as well. Um, and it's a complex one. And I think it's a question that you know, we, we can answer to some extent, but and it's a question that people are wrestling with in particular uh, with respect to what's going on now with respect to our nation and the, and the crisis we're dealing with. Um, and it's being sorted out in the educational realm in particular, many of you are aware of that for those of you who, who largest who dabble in the education field um, that you know, many states have been sued based on their constitution's guarantee for a sound basic education and they've been sued and had to reshape and restructure how their tax systems provided for communities, low income communities and particular communities of color. And we currently have debates that are circulating across um, you know, think tanks and in public policy circles, trying to determine and figure out um, how, what's the ideal level of progressivity in a local income tax system and in a state income tax system and trying to figure out um, what, is the, what are the best um, poverty alleviating measures to include in a tax code, like earn state earned income tax credits, for example, to mirror the federal income tax credit, or refundable ed education credits versus non refundable ed education credits and, credits, and a whole host of other measures that are being debated and continue being debated, um, although very few states actually have those in place. And increasingly, we're seeing a lot more attention being paid by communities and researchers to questions of equity and budgeting and po policy decision making. Decision -making. Uh, Living Cities is one of those examples if you're interested in diving down into that a bit as well. Now this last question is something I think we can touch on a bit here today and it kind of provides a little bit of context for what we're talking about, particularly as we think about how we will be emerging from this COVID crisis and the role that local governments can play given that um, governors and mayors are the individuals who are essentially leading the charge with addressing the, the challenges um, presented by COVID and will be leading the charge as we move forward. You know, we think about taxes, we tend to think about tax payments, we tend to think about funds, we tend to think about direct expenditures by local governments on schools, parks, and services, but we often ignore tax expenditures, which are provision, provisions in the tax code that provide special considerations for activities or individuals who meet certain criteria and can be, can, can be um, con constructed in various ways. Um, deductions, um, for example, the mortgage interest deduction, credits, uh, earned income tax credits, exclusions, uh, one another example where you exclude uh, pro pro employer provided health insurance uh, from your income. Um, deferrals, income earned today, but tax in the future. Um, exemptions, uh, or like mutual bond interest being exempted from income. Uh, preferential rates for different things. And lastly, tax abased maintenance, which are full or partial reductions in the property tax liability owed to a local government or to a state. And that last one, tax abatements, we'll touch on that a little bit because I think it kind of can underscore this, 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 this question about uh, recovery, about COVID and what we can do about it. Um, and that's when we talk about tax incentives. Now this slide highlights some of the findings from the research on tax incentive performance. And what we know is that typically money in the form of foregone tax revenue rarely was a deciding factor in firm decision to locate its business. And what we're talking about here is the money paid out to Amazon, paid out to Foxconn, paid out to all of these companies, big and small, 
to locate their firms in a local community, to keep their firms in local community um, through the promise of jobs, uh, in increased economic activity and so forth. But as that first bullet shows you that in most cases, those firms would have located in those communities, even if it were not for the incentives. And what happens typically is, and in a lot of cases, firms decide where they're going to go, then they pit two communities against one another, and they've already made their decision. They're just trying to gain even more uh, from the local community from standpoint of tax abatements and other incentives. And that's typically how that plays out, and the research bears that out. Um, secondly, tax incentives do not typically generate the economic activity that, that is promised uh, by virtue of the bids that are circulated um, in that process when, com when communities are competing for those corporations. And so we don't see the, the, the realized gains in economic activity. And lastly, uh, the promised jobs don't materialize in a lot of cases as well. Um, eight out of 10 new jobs created by tax incentives are filled by outsiders and they don't go to community members or the unemployed. And in particular, when you're talking about those communities that are disadvantaged, impoverished communities, communities of color, um, you don't see those individuals getting employed in high numbers. Many of those jobs are often temporary jobs because if you're looking at the evaluations for many of these programs, it's important to make distinctions between the temporary jobs, the construction jobs, and the permanent jobs. Oftentimes you see inflated numbers of 10,000 jobs created by a project, but if you separate out the jobs that are created by construction, which are often imported labor uh, specialists that come in, welders and so forth. And then when their job is gone, they move on to the next state, to the next community. Um, and, and what's left is typically in a lot of cases, low wage service sector jobs that don't provide uh, living wages in some cases and don't provide a route to the middle class for those citizens of those communities. Now, it's not to say that these programs, whether you're talking about empowerment zones, new market tax credits, or now in opportunity zones aren't or don't ever provide any benefit but on the whole, there's a serious question about the cost versus the benefit with respect to these programs, especially the benefit for, 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 for black citizens and the communities who have to deal with issues like gentrification, which is one of the major complicating factors um, as a result of these types of initiatives. And so that's the end of my slides. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just kind of wrap up and, and, and say there's a lot of things I didn't talk about, you know, left unaddressed is the, you know, increasing regressivity of our overall tax system at both the federal and state and, and state level. And my colleague Leslie will kind of point to some of those issues in his presentation. But so we've seen this increased regressivity from the 80s up to now. Um, and the reality also I didn't point out was the fact that um, over $447 billion annually goes uncollected by the IRS. And that money is disproportionately money that is underreported by high income earners. But the reality on the flip side is that is that the IRS disproportionately goes after low income filers as opposed to going after high income, high net worth individuals um, with no plan in the works to figure out how to uh, flip that imbalance and, and get back some of that $447 billion annually that is uncollected. Um, so I hope that I provide you with a bit of informative context for understanding um, that the affirmation that black taxpayers matter is far from a given because of our system of taxation is problematic to say the least as it relates to the ability of the system to provide equitable treatment to taxpayers. And it's a historical, it's a very historical issue. And as we look to solutions for addressing these inequities uncovered by the COVID crisis, we have to look at state and local systems of taxation and how they are related to the federal system of taxation. And in addition, how they, in addition to how they spend their revenues. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Leslie Will. Thanks so much, Donnie and, and, and Stephen, for, for really um, you know, both, both showing some of the systemic issues in the tax system and, and more specifically some of the direct impacts that, we're, we're, that um, vulnerable communities are facing right now. And, and thanks to Francine uh, for really kind introduction, and, and it's really a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today, really look at the, the, the recent legislation that, uh, that directs payments and benefits to individuals provides a real-time opportunity to discuss and consider the ways in which our legislation and our tax legislation in particular at times fails to provide the benefits to all members of society and all aspects of society. So what I'm going to do today is, as Francine mentioned, I'm working as co-counsel with, with my colleagues at the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, uh, you know, Rob Friedman and his colleagues at ICAP. And um, we're looking at 
and, and I'm hoping to today provide context for litigation that, um, that is challenging some of CARE's provisions to provide benefits to some of our most vulnerable uh, citizens. And I'll, I'll hope to provide a perspective on uh, potentially how to challenge IRS actions that appear to be inconsistent with the statute that Congress drafted or perhaps inconsistent with broader norms of in administrative law or constitutional law. So I'll, I'll give that context. And, and then in the second part of the presentation, Rob will come in and give um, some more specifics about the, the, the nature of, of the, the specific litigation that we're, we're working on. Um, but as an initial kind of um, sort of table setting aspect, I, I just want to mention and, and briefly describe some of the main aspects of the CARES legislation and in, in particular how uh, Congress um, identified the tax system as a way to provide immediate benefits to, to Americans who are, are suffering so, so, so um, severely at this time. And, and essentially what, what Congress did in the CARES legislation was to provide for uh, immediate payment of economic impact payments of up to $1,200 a person and uh, $500 for qualifying children that is um, um, essentially meant to be paid immediately, to be paid as rapidly as possible according to the legislation. It's nominally framed as a credit against uh, 2020 income taxes and um, could be uh, actually reconciled on filing of, of a tax return in the calendar year 2021 when one files a 2020 tax return. But in fact, in substance, it really is a mechanism um, to provide immediate payment. And that is done through the IRS. And that is done uh, um, in part because the IRS has the capability and, and, and information to deliver payments quickly. And it's, um, it's not unusual in, in that uh, Congress in, in a, a couple of times previously has has used the IRS to deliver immediate payments and following the Great Recession in 2008. Um, that was the most recent time when Congress uh, legislated the payment of stimulus payments in the form, form of an advance credit um, that was delivered immediately and that were reconciled on an ultimate uh, in a later year's tax return. But this is somewhat unusual. The, the actual EIP payments, the economic impact payments in this legislation are unusual um, relative to past actions in that, um, in, in a few ways, in, in, you know, in, including that not um, every individual had to file a tax return to receive the payment. And so um, the legislation itself identified to, uh, th that the IRS could in fact make payments to certain beneficiaries, um, uh, uh, people who receive uh, federal benefits, including uh, social security benefits, and uh, initially, the IRS actually wanted to require individuals to file a return, but uh, uh, shortly after the uh, legislation's enactment, IRS actually provided the mechanism for um, individuals to receive payments automatically without filing returns, certain individuals, as well as setting up a, um, what they refer to as a non-filer portal to allow individuals who otherwise didn't have a filing obligation to to provide information to receive the payments, as well as to add information about children who might be entitled to receive or generate the um, eligibility to receive the additional $500. We'll talk about how that, that didn't work as, as fully planned, but it was unusual in, in that this is a, you know, typically uh, individuals self-attest and file tax returns to receive benefits. Other aspects were unusual in, in that typically as well, when someone files a tax return is in, in due to get a refund, the refund is subject to offset, meaning that the IRS has the, uh, the authority to apply a refund against the past due tax liability, against uh, certain state tax obligations, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and other, other federal debts as well. The CARES provision does not subject the EIP payments to offsets with the exception of child support. And so that again is unusual. This is really, it, it reflects the importance that Congress see, saw in, in ensuring that individuals receive this payment and receive this payment free from access to, you know, to other, other obligations. Congress I specifically identified that the IRS is, is to deliver the benefit um, as quickly as possible. It allowed, the IRS actually delivered, has delivered most of this by direct deposit 
I think um, as of the end of May, it delivered 160 million payments, totaling about $270 billion. And about um, a little under three quarters of that has, has been done by direct deposit to individuals' bank accounts. Uh, the legislation as well indicated that, um, that the IRS is supposed to make this payment quickly, as rapidly as possible, but it also had a closing date of December 30th, 31st, 2020. Um, if the payments were not uh, uh, made or allowed by that date, then individuals would only be entitled to receive the payment when they filed a 2020 tax return, again, um, re relating to the 2021 calendar year. So let's move on to the, to the next slide. And, and all this kind of goes to, to a really important point, which is that, and, and, um, and Donnie ad addressed this in, in his presentation as well, is, is that the IRS over time is, is, is increasingly becoming a, um, a, a key um, player in ensuring that uh, our most vulnerable uh, citizens receive benefits and are entitled to receive money that can help them meet life's necessities. And, and the IRS's mission statement reflects it's, it's uh, really has an enforcement focus. It, it talks about uh, understanding, helping Americans understand and meet their tax responsibilities and enforcing the law with integrity and fairness to all. And increasingly though, and, and, and accelerating when, when in welfare reform in, in, in the 1990s, the IRS has been be becoming um, increasingly a key player in, in, in ensuring our, um, our, 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 our most vulnerable citizens receive benefits. And that is done through, as Donnie mentioned, the, uh, the delivery of refundable credits and, and, and including the earned income tax credit. So move on to the next slide. And, and, and so, of course, the, the IRS is, is, is it's in, in, uh, a key player in, in ensuring that the government gets access to revenues and it collects and it does a great job in, in collecting um, uh, revenues and, and is, it, it, um, income taxes, estate and gift taxes. It processes you know, hundreds of millions of tax returns and uh, on, on top of that, though, is when you look at the increasing role that refundable credits play in our, um, in our tax system, um, the, the IRS is, is really doing much more. And so Donnie mentioned the earned income tax credit. And just again, uh, you know, um, many of you uh, are viewing this are not tax, tax people. You know, refundable credits are credits that on a dollar for dollar basis reduce tax liability but to the extent that someone is entitled to a credit that exceeds a tax liability, the, um, that, that results in the IRS actually giving, uh, giving a refund. And um, last, in fiscal year 2018, the IRS issued almost $464 billion in, in tax refunds and a significant amount of refunds is attributable to the earned income tax credit and, and other credits such as the child tax credit as well. And, and as the slide indicates, the, the presence of tax credits is really a key determinant of moving individuals and especially children out of poverty. And so um, in you know, last fiscal year, 27 million households received approximately $70 billion in earned income tax credits. And all this again, just, just shows to, goes to show how important the IRS is in, in the welfare of, of, of many of our most vulnerable citizens in this country. So let's just move on to the next slide. And, and all this is, it is important in terms of, of the, the general context in which individuals interact with the IRS. And, and so over time, the um, you know, Congress and the courts have really given the IRS a, a wide berth in terms of its ability to administer the tax laws outside the, the normal kind of checks that might um, that, that have, have been generally applied to other federal agencies, and and so um, this has been waning over time, in part because of the IRS's increasingly important role, not just in collecting revenues, but in doing more. You know, from Affordable Care Act to other refundable credits that that I've mentioned and, and that Donnie's mentioned as well. So over time, the, the the courts and Congress are pushing back on this, but but you know, essentially, the starting point had been with the tax system that. That tax law is and the collection of revenues is so important, the so-called lifeblood of the government, that um, norms associated with administrative law and constitutional law should um, did not apply with the same force when it comes to 
to the IRS as, as compared to other agencies. And um, that's manifested in a number of different ways, including um, when, when we think about, for example, the, the, the norms, when, when you look at federal agencies that administer benefits, for example, typically uh, things like constitutional protections and procedural due process that provide protections to ensure that individuals are not deprived of property rights prior to um, adequate consideration of notice and hearing. Well, generally speaking, those constitutional norms have not applied to influence the tax system's procedures. Most protections are statutorily based and based in Title 26, of the Internal Revenue Code, not in constitutional law norms or under norms of the Administrative Procedure Act, which have applied to other administrative agencies outside the tax system. You know, part of this, you know, landscape is 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 a, a statute known as the Anti-Injunction Act in the Internal Revenue Code, which essentially provides that uh, it it moves away from federal court jurisdiction any suits that have the purpose of restraining the assessment or collection of of tax, and that is subject. Now, there's a, a Supreme Court case which is, which will be decided um, next term that it addresses the implication of the Anti-Injunction Act in light of the modern uh, tax system where the tax system is doing much more. But right now, the Anti-Injunction Act has provided a real barrier to, to uh, challenges to some of the things that the IRS is doing, including potentially in lit litigation involving uh, CARES Act provisions. So um, let, let's move on to the next slide. Um, and well, let's bring this, bring this back again to CARES, right? So I mentioned in, um, in an earlier slide, the importance of the CARES legislation in terms of delivering benefits to individuals in the form of, of economic impact payments. But there is this notion again from the Anti-Injunction Act, which restrains courts from having jurisdiction over challenges to that relate to assessment, or tax assessment or collection. The uh, Internal Revenue Code provides essentially a defined mechanism for challenging IRS action in enforcement proceedings. If you're a, a lucky you know, taxpayer subject to audit, well, you can challenge what the IRS is doing in an audit. If you file, if you believe you've overpaid your taxes, the Internal Revenue Code provides a mechanism for filing a refund suit, but that requires exhaustion. You have to file a refund claim and the claim has to be denied or six months has to pass in order to um, be able to bring a suit in federal district court or the Court of Federal Claims. And when you take a step back, well, how does this then really relate to CARES? Well, that this normal mechanism that applies to tax challenges doesn't work well with a legislation which is intending to provide immediate benefits to people who are suffering in a pandemic. Because the tax system is predicated on a challenge in a, in a, you know, in a time out in the future. And that, that is not um, something that is generally speaking gonna give the opportunity to challenge legislation or IRS action in a timely manner. So um, there had been you know, a concern that if, if um, as in our case that Rob and I are, um, are, are co-counsel on, if um, you know, CARES carves out payments to individuals who um, if, in, uh, if, for example, one parent do, is undocumented or doesn't have a social security number authorized for work, if in fact, um, as we believe that it is a violation of equal protection principles, the normal tax procedure is, doesn't allow for immediate challenge. And so um, this creates the opportunity, I think, to further think about how this tax exceptionalist approach to procedure is really inconsistent with the way that Congress is continuously using the tax system to provide benefits and to ensure payments to those who are in need of payments. And that is, again, really inconsistent with what Congress is, is trying to do to ensure that, um, that individuals are, are, are benefiting from the use of the tax system. So um, next slide, please. So that takes us back to, to the, the, the case that you know, Rob's gonna talk about it in, in greater detail. But it, the, the, the context here is that courts are increasingly aware or increasingly um, recognizing that the, 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 the exceptionalist approach to, to tax procedure and tax cases is, is ill-suited for what Congress has been doing. 
And so in, um, in, in the RV versus Mnookin case, which, which Rob and I are co-counsel on, we ha have in a part of our argument is that, that in fact, one does not need to go through the time intensive exhaust, um, requirements around exhausting administrative claim in order to get federal court uh, um, juris jurisdiction over challenges to the, the, the way Congress has set up the CARES Act because there is other there are other st statutes that provide jurisdiction, including the so-called Tucker Act under Title 28, which provides for uh, uh, federal court jurisdiction for money mandating statutes that um, which in fact is really what CARES is, right? CARES is is really not a, a statute which provides for in substance a refund, but it provides an immediate mechanism for the payment to um, to individuals who. Congress has identified um, as, as needing money immediately and, and for individuals who are suffering under the uh, current pandemic conditions. So we are exploring and in, in our litigation, exploring ways that, that you know, really that, that um, in ways that, that courts should recognize and the IRS should recognize that in fact, what, um, what the reality in today's environment is, is that the IRS is, is, is much more than a tax collection agency. It is, if not the key, one of the key players in, in ensuring the health and welfare uh, of our most vulnerable citizens. And again, there are other cases as well. And, and, and you know, for tax proceduralists such as I am, you, you're I'm looking carefully at, at the way in which courts are increasingly recognizing that in fact, um, you know, administrative law norms are, and constitutional law norms should be should have a place in, in looking at the, the adequacy of what Congress and what the IRS are doing. And so a uh, case flagged on the slide is Cohen versus United States, which is a case that that um, allowed in the in the DC circuit allowed for a claim based upon the Administrative Procedure Act that evaluated the uh, the inadequacy of, of IRS procedures to ensure that individuals had the opportunity to seek a refund in on illegally collected telephone excise tax payments. And that's a, a significant case because again, it's another opening in the door of allowing a, uh, a claim based upon administrative law norms outside normal tax enforcement proceedings. And I, you know, we think, and we'll, we'll come back at the end after, after my colleague Rob speaks about in more detail about our litigation, there are increasing opportunities. You know, CARES presents Obviously, we're living in a in a in a horrible time, um, but CARES also exposes not only some of the inequities in our system, but also opportunities that litigants and advocates can use to really ensure that our most vulnerable have an opportunity to to, to get in court and and to challenge what we think are inequities in the way that both Congress and and agencies are applying some of these provisions. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it to, to Rob to, to, to um, you know, get more in, into the specifics of our litigation. Thanks, Les, I appreciate it. Uh, and thanks, Danny and Stephen, for your incredibly informative presentations uh, and to Francine for organizing this. Um, so I'm going to talk in a little more detail about the discriminatory provisions in the CARES Act and, and how that's affecting the distribution of economic impact payments provide an overview of not just our uh, legal challenge, the one that Les and I are working on, but also others that have been brought and, and provide an update on the status of that litigation. Um, so as Les mentioned, uh, economic impact payments are distributed to uh, tax filers in the amounts of up to $1,200 per person and up to $500 uh, per tax filers uh, for each child. Um, and there are certain, uh, requirements that the tax filer needs to satisfy to, to get that payment. They need to have their income below a certain threshold. Uh, if they're a non-citizen, uh, they have to have a, a certain, uh, spent a certain amount of time in the country. Uh, and for the child, the child can't be self-sufficient and needs to live with the, the tax filer essentially establishing dependency. Uh, but on top of those requirements, which I tend to think of as need-based and, and measuring uh, the, the importance of financial assistance, there's an, an additional requirement that the CARES Act imposes that the tax filer have a social security number uh, and, or a valid social security number, which is defined under the statute. And in practice, what it means is that uh, economic impact payments will only be distributed to US citizens uh, and to non-citizens who have work authorization. 
Uh, and that leaves out uh, undocumented immigrants who are by law prohibited from obtaining social security numbers uh, and instead must use what's known as an individual taxpayer identification number to file their taxes. Um, but that doesn't prevent them from filing taxes and, and they do in significant numbers, uh, approximately 10 million uh, to, to be specific pay taxes and are categorically excluded from receiving economic impact payments. Uh, and this is so uh, even though collectively they're paying billions of dollars a year in taxes. Um, and uh, this may seem uh, intuitive, but it's important to flag today during this presentation that undocumented immigrants are overwhelmingly in the minority communities that are in so many other ways burdened and, and not given uh, equal treatment by the tax code. Uh, a study from the Pew Research Center last year uh, estimated that approximately 80% of recent undocumented immigrants are from Latin America, so Mexico, Central America, and South America. Uh, and the point of that study was actually to highlight a, a decline in, in, in that share. So it's always been uh, the vast majority of the population. Um, and it's, it, it's really critical that the CARES Act, I, I mean, I, Stephen touched on this, that undocumented immigrants are excluded from a number of benefits. So this is not something new. Um, and uh, what is Im important to flag though, is that the CARES Act extends this discrimination and this exclusion beyond the tax filer that, to uh, family members. So if a uh, undocumented immigrant is married to a US citizen or, uh, or a non-citizen who's lawfully present um, and they file their taxes jointly, uh, both will be excluded from receiving an economic impact payment. Uh, and that has resulted in the exclusion of approximately 1.7 million spouses. Uh, additionally, if they have US citizen children, as many do, um, even if the child is listed as a citizen with a social security number on the tax return, uh, the child will not uh, get any benefits. Uh, so the, the CARES Act does earmark a certain portion uh, as intended to uh, accommodate the, uh, the presence of a child in the family, but even that portion is denied if the parent is undocumented. Uh, and that is currently excluding approximately 4 million uh, citizen children from the benefits of the CARES Act. Um, and this is having a uh, particularly harsh impact at a particularly vulnerable time on a particularly vulnerable group. Uh, Stephen helpfully went over a lot of this, so um, that's good because I'm somewhat running out of time. But uh, just to briefly recap, th they work in some of the industries that have been hit hardest by a lot of job loss. I mean, the most obvious one that comes to mind is restaurant work, but also residential construction, residential services. Um, and it's more difficult for them to just try and get a, a new job because of the limited employment opportunities. Uh, as, as Stephen flagged, they are not eligible for unemployment benefits generally, and that includes uh, the expanded unemployment under the CARES Act. They're often ineligible under local aid, both by operation under some interpretations of federal law, um, but also um, just as a result of what you could call proactive exclusion from municipalities crafting their uh, local assistance in ways that uh, exclude undocumented immigrants and their families. Uh, and then they also have limited access to private credit, which you know carries its own burdens and, and risks of, of downstream consequences, but can also provide a, a lifeline right now. Uh, you know, to, to kind of look into that, I even went to a, a payday loan website and saw what their requirements are uh, and a social security number was one of the requirements. And obviously payday loans are problematic in, in many ways, but it shows just how limited the options are. Uh, and I also uh, want to flag that the, the exclusion of citizen children is unusual in the distribution of federal assistance. Uh, there's a, a, a number of programs that are distributed where assistance is distributed to households. So that includes supplemental nutrition and assistance program, what we think of as food stamps, what we think of as welfare, uh, housing assistance, um, Although I, I guess after uh, Donnie's thought-provoking question, I'm speaking of Section 8 housing assistance. Um, it, it, the statutes and regulations are crafted in a way that uh, if there's a mixed status family, uh, 
uh, assistance will flow on a pro rata basis to accommodate the, the US citizen child. Uh, and that it includes the child tax credit as well. Um, but the CARES Act doesn't work that way. It excludes the entire family. Uh, and the only other program that, that we're aware of that operates that way at the federal level is the earned income tax credit. But that's of course a, a bit different because it is focused on incentivizing work from the parent. So it does have a, an adult centric uh, focus. Um, so moving on to uh, the lawsuits that are now targeting this discrimination. I mean, immediately when this happened, you know, people were excited that the federal government was providing some assistance, and then it became clear that they were excluded, uh, and undocumented immigrants and their allies spoke out uh, often and loudly, and it's resulted in the filing of a number of class action lawsuits. Uh, and these can be grouped into two categories. There are a number of challenges by spouses of undocumented immigrants, uh, and I've listed four of them on the slide here. There are actually two additional ones. Uh, so four have been filed by a single law firm and they all bear the, the title Doe versus Trump. I've left that have two that uh, have basically had no movement in the lawsuit and are in a standstill. Um, but each of these other cases are, are going forward to some degree. Um, and there are three claims that have been brought in each one. Uh, a substantive due process and an equal protection claim, both uh, centered around the, their right to marry. So the substantive due process claim is that there's a penalty against them for their marriage. The equal protection claim is that they are being punished because of who they married, as opposed to whether they are married, trying to, and in my view, uh, successfully distinguishing the normal uh, concept of what we think of as the marriage penalty under the tax law. Uh, and then they have a First Amendment claim that filing their taxes jointly uh, is a way of expressing uh, the importance of their marriage and their commitment to one another and that they're being punished for that expression uh, by being denied economic impact payments solely because they're filing jointly. Uh, and these lawsuits are uh, all seeking an injunction, uh, striking down the the requirement of a valid social security number uh, and a declaratory judgment that it is unlawful. Uh, and then the in the other bucket is the lawsuit that Les and I are working on. Uh, it's brought by US citizen children uh, and their parents on behalf of them. Uh, and uh, there's a single claim uh, under the Fifth Amendment's due process clause, but uh, advancing an equal protection theory. Uh, and the idea there is that the citizen children are being punished for the immigration status of their parents, where similarly situated citizen children who have citizen parents uh, are not so punished. Uh, and, you know, this is drawing on not only case law uh, where this is happening in, in the context of immigration status. So, uh, you know, states have charged higher tuitions to citizen state schools, I mean, have charged high tuitions to citizen uh, children of undocumented immigrants. That's been challenged. They've denied driver's license to citizen children of undocumented immigrants. Uh, so we're drawing on that case law. And in addition, uh, we're going back a, a couple decades to um, a lot of case law uh, challenging exclusion of illegitimate children who were punished because of their parents' marital status. So it's the same basic concept. Um, and we are also seeking an injunction and a declaratory judgment uh, and in addition, we're asking for money damages uh, and less briefly touched on this, that uh, we consider this to be uh, a claim that can be brought under the Tucker Act uh, because it obligates the government to, to make a payment to these families. Um, so there are three disputed issues going across all the cases. Uh, and the first two of these flow into the idea or reflect the idea that Les discussed of tax exceptionalism. Um, the government is arguing that none of the plaintiffs have standing. So even though uh, each, one, each plaintiff in these cases uh, is currently does not have the money in their bank account, whereas their neighbors do, uh, the government is arguing for the spouses that they have to wait until 2021 to uh, officially apply or formally apply for a credit based on their 2020 tax return, be denied that credit, and then they can... Uh, file a claim. Um, and for the children, the government is arguing that because they're not the direct recipients of, of the 
economic impact payments, uh, they have no basis to complain. Uh, of course, the money is uh, increased to accommodate the presence of children. And so we think that it, the lawsuit is ripe, but um, as in most things, the, the judge will need to ultimately decide. Um, the government is also arguing that the plaintiffs have to wait until 2021 to bring in an administrative refund action. Uh, and let's explain that. So I'll, I'll jump to the, the last issue that's in each case, which is that the government is arguing that this is not actually what the case law refers to as an alienage classification um, and what might be uh, in, in plain English referred to as uh, a classification on the base of basis of immigration status. Um, and the government is arguing instead that this is simply a requirement of work authorization. Uh, and that's what the social security number reflects. Um, and our position is that there's no earned income requirement, so there's no need for work authorization. Uh, and also because the social security number requirement applies to children, uh, including one of our plaintiffs who is not yet a, a year old, uh, a work authorization requirement would not make much sense. Um, but it, those are the two dueling uh, positions. Um, the spouse cases have a couple of additional issues. One is that the government is arguing that this is just like a, a normal marriage penalty that uh, they are being, they being the plaintiffs are, are uh, being deprived of a Bennett simply because they are married, not because of who they are married to. Uh, obviously the plaintiffs are pushing back against that noting that others who are married are still entitled to the full range of benefits. Uh, and the government is arguing that uh, expressing one's marriage on a tax return that's filed separately from the spouse uh, is the equivalent of uh, filing, expressing one's marriage on a tax return that's filed jointly. Uh, and filing separately does allow the citizen uh, spouse to collect an economic impact payment, though it will carry other financial burdens at a minimum. Uh, and in the plaintiff's view, uh, is not, does not have the same robust meaning and symbolic meaning as filing taxes jointly. And then finally, there's a, a class action procedural issue, the first file rule. Uh, and this um, occurs when a number of class actions are filed on the same subject matter. Uh, ordinarily, it will be the first one that is filed that will go forward. Uh, that doesn't mean that the uh, attorneys uh, who filed that case will necessarily be class counsel. That's a, a bit more complicated of an issue. Um, but the government is seeking to put some of the cases on hold while the earlier filed cases go forward. Uh, and then finally, there's been one decision so far, which is uh, in the case that Les and I brought on behalf of the citizen children. Uh, and it was on what you might call a quasi motion to dismiss. It was done on an abbreviated schedule, uh, but the government laid out those three issues that I just went over um, and the court rejected each one, at least preliminarily. So it found that the uh, the children were suffering a, a current injury and had standing to raise that claim, even though they are not the recipients of the aid in the first instance. Uh, the, the court found that this did not need to be brought as a refund action because nobody is seeking to collect money that they had, uh, that they've already turned over to the IRS. Uh, and the court found that at least at the pleading stage, uh, we had su uh, sufficiently alleged that this is a classification based on immigration status and that the citizen children are being punished for that classification through no fault of their own. Um, so with that uh, overview of the existing litigation, uh, we wanted to close up by bringing uh, to your attention a few existing issues that are not yet the subject of litigation, but are still problematic uh, and, or potentially problematic at least. and. Um, are disproportionately affecting black and brown communities. So uh, the CARES Act provides under the statute at least that economic impact payments go to, as I mentioned, anybody who meets the, the income requirements and the social valid social security number requirements, et cetera. Uh, but the IRS has taken the position that they, the payments are not allowed to go to people who are currently in jail or prison on a conviction or on parole and in a few additional categories. Uh, we have searched in vain for a, a statutory basis for this and, and have yet to find one, but it is the IRS's position. 
Uh, and as you can imagine, because of over-policing in black and brown communities, this is going to disproportionately affect black and, and brown families. Um, and I think it's important to highlight that this isn't going to affect only the person who is currently in jail or prison, um, but it's going to affect their family members as well, who uh, in many instances are providing support. Uh, right now, many jails are not providing basic necessities in normal times like soap without requiring uh, inmates to, to pay for that. Um, and uh, that's even more important, obviously, in, in the time of the pandemic. And allowing families to, that are, are not in jail to use their own resources to um, deal with their, the hardship that they're experiencing um, would, would make a big difference. But if they have to allocate some of that money to their family members who are uh, incarcerated, that's an additional drain. Um, and it also relates to the, um, the next category where the, the IRS is taking the position that money needs to be paid back, which is to people who have passed away before they've received their economic impact payments. Um, this might be a bit of a closer statutory issue, and, and you might have read about this in the news. It was just released that there's been $1.4 billion in total paid out to people who have uh, passed away. Uh, and the Inspector General report said that um, this was, you know, done uh, basically through a difference of opinion among the IRS and, and uh, the Treasury Department uh, officials. Um, but if you think about that slide that Stephen put up and, and who is dying in, in large numbers from COVID, you again see that this is going to disproportionately impact um, black and brown communities. And obviously people are passing away from things besides COVID. Um, but this again is a program designed to help people with low income. And so that disproportionate impact is going to come through again. Um, and right now, the I think the IRS's position is that they're not going to take affirmative action to recoup it. But, um, you know, they're saying they're not currently going to do it. And uh, it raises that question uh, that Donnie closed on of, uh, is this where the resources of collection should be uh, focused on when there's a lot of wrongful and culpable non-payment or, or um, false claims filed when this is something that, uh, you know, obviously the deceased person uh, did not do intentionally and would be uh, of help to their surviving families. Uh, and so with that, I will pass it back to Les. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, and I, I know, in the interest of time, we're we're, we're at the end of the pretty much end of the, end of the time. I'll, I'll just quickly identify a couple of, of points around um, some other issues that that we see as, as potentially subject to litigation. I should start by just mentioning that that I, I do want to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts that the IRS has made to to, to you know in in really short amount of time get money out to those who need it. You know, delivering 160 million payments. Um, over the course of a couple of months and is, um, you know, a, a major undertaking, especially given that the IRS itself, its employees are, are, are suffering. Um, IRS has been subject to significant budget shortfalls over the, the past decade. So uh, in, in my closing comments where I cr criticize what the IRS has done, I do want to acknowledge that, that the, the news is not all bad. But um, when you think about the, the EIP payments, in, in some ways it's useful to think about three distinct categories. Um, you know, one of which is, are eligible individuals who filed their tax return in 2019 or 2018. And those people got payments automatically. Um, then there were individuals who received social security benefits, um, SSI benefits or, or uh, VA benefits. And um, IRS eventually agreed that those individuals would receive payments automatically. They did not need to do a file return if they didn't otherwise have a filing obligation. Um, but they did have to uh, enter information about qualifying children in, in a remarkably brief amount of time in order to get payments for qualifying children that they might be entitled to receive. And um, those, um, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that briefly. And then thirdly, there are all these other individuals who are, are not, who had not filed a tax return in 2018 or 19, and who did not receive uh, uh, benefits, who um, in order to receive the payment, uh, 
the EIP actually had to file information with the IRS and the IRS opened up a portal to allow those non-filers to, to essentially submit a simplified tax return. And so you have those three different categories, but in the second category, the, um, the IRS, uh, you know, the, the beneficiaries who wanted to add children, the IRS really um, only allowed for the adding of children through a very short time timeline from two to five days, depending upon the type of, of uh, uh, benefits that are received. And I, I just bring this back to some of the earlier comments I made in, in my presentation, which is when you think about the manner in which agencies have to notify about uh, benefits and how, for example, procedural due process norms apply to notifying individuals about entitlement to, to benefits, those other agencies are often grappling with the requirements that notice be reasonably designed to reflect the circumstances of the individuals to which the agency interacts. And those, you know, the, those notice requirements are rooted in, in procedural due process, Fifth Amendment type, type challenges, which as I've mentioned, are really not part and parcel of what the IRS has had to address when thinking about the ways in which it notifies individuals in its communications. So, you, you, the, uh, and, and the, the IRS decisions to, um, that it made to make, uh, to inform individuals are I think subject to challenge in, in, on constitutional grounds and potentially administrative law norm uh, principles as well. And, 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 I, and, and I, I think that there is a, a lot of attention and energy around thinking about the ways in which the IRS has administered these payments for our most vulnerable. So, you know, in, anticipate that there is really an opportunity to, kind of, you know, further prompt the IRS to take into account. And perhaps, for example, for the, you know, for the hundreds of thousands of individuals who, who failed to add children to, um, uh, to, to ensure that they receive payments on, on their behalf, perhaps the IRS might open up um, an opportunity for allowing individuals to add children to receive those payments. And, and in fact, the GAO report that Rob mentioned that came out yesterday actually indicated that IRS processes um, that it used to allow individuals to add children, even though you know, th there were problems around people getting notice, for, the, for, the, for, the, for those that were able to understand what the IRS wanted and to get through and add the information, there was a glitch in, in the way that the IRS processed that information. And in fact, um, the, the payments for children were not actually made. So the IRS, the, 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 the report, the GAO report yesterday, uh, indicates that the IRS is working on a fix for that, but there are perhaps opportunities for other areas where at least the IRS has not yet publicly disclosed that it's intending to provide a manner for uh, providing additional payments. So I think that the, the takeaway here is stay tuned. I think there, there's, there's plenty of opportunities for further uh, scrutiny of what the IRS is doing or is not doing. Thank you, panelists. What an incredible presentation. As all of you know who are listening out there, I know my head was nodding many times during Stevens, Donnie's, uh, Les's, and Robert's presentation. And I think if anything is obvious, it's that taxpayer rights are human rights and that the tax system is increasingly more important to delivering social benefits. Unfortunately, it's complicated and access to tax justice is critical. Let's give a round of applause to our phenomenal panelists. And I hope that each of you out there in the audience will consider joining the section of civil rights and social justice, the ABA, they are pushing out these free webinars on a daily basis, sometimes two a day. It's a phenomenal team. And as you might imagine, they are, you know, they need your support, not only for with uh, as a member, but also donations. These are tough times for all nonprofits. Many of you have asked if this program and the resources are going to be available and they will be emailed to you uh, if you registered. 
and then this will be posted. We were live on YouTube right now. That's going to be posted on the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice website and check out their other programs. Enroll and all of you be safe out there. Uh, wear your masks and have a wonderful and safe weekend. Thank you all.